Good morning. <laughs> All right, this is the unofficial pre-start. So I'm here to give an unofficial welcome first, also to go over some housekeeping. So I'd just like to invite everybody to come into the room, especially to these very lonely front row seats. The panelists will want to see your faces, so thank you. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Molly Chen, uh, monitoring, evaluation, research, learning, adapting, MERLA specialist um, for RTI International. I'm just so happy that you're all here this morning. So a couple of quick housekeeping. Um, the bathroom is... I get the fun part. Huh? The bathroom is outside, and there are signs, and these are the restroom codes for the men and women's bathroom. Also, quick, quick thing, the men's doesn't need a code, actually. Oh, some insider information. The men's bathroom does not need a code. OK. Um, we also have a hashtag today. It is RTI Learns. So for all of you social media folks, please feel free to tweet and post. And I have an announcement that one of our panelists, Zachary Buckhay, unfortunately was unable to join us today. Um, Zachary is the lead of the learning team uh, at USAID Bureau for Food Security. But I absolutely want to thank and recognize him for all the contributions he's had. Um, we've, we've been co-collaborating. Of course we've been. It's collaborating, learning, and adapting. And he has just been such a fantastic um, person to to learn from, and so even though we're very disappointed, he is serving his civic duty of jury duty. So we thank him for, for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, also, just I'll, we'd like to invite everybody to stay after the event um, for coffee and some more networking. Our speakers are going to stick around and, you know, happy to chat with you. So without further ado, I'd like to invite... Rajiv Colasso, uh, Senior Manager, Monitoring, Evaluation, Research, Learning, and Adapting um, team at RTA International, who's really going to kick off our event. So, Rajiv. Great. Thanks, Molly. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Rajiv Colasso. As Molly mentioned, I work in Monitoring, Evaluation, Research, Learning, Adapting, MERLA. I know another acronym for us. Um, um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here, uh, and also everybody online. I think we have a lot of people um, who've joined in via the online live streaming. To all of you present here, especially thanks for braving that gloomy weather out there. So, uh, so that's really nice. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, uh, I'd like to start with perhaps a personal story about myself, uh, and also about the rest of my colleagues, many of who are in this room today and who helped put this learning event together. Uh, most of us started our careers um, in monitoring and evaluation, m and &E, research, program management, program administration. Um, and a lot of us had this nagging problem or this little nagging voice in our heads. And that was, well, how are we using the data that we have in the work that we do? More importantly, how are our in-country partners using the data that they have to effectively inform the work that they do? Uh, how are we learning from that data? And more importantly, what do we then do to take that learning into programmatic adaptation? When I first heard about, uh, I have a confession, when I first heard about USAID's collaborating learning and adapting approach, or CLA, I will admit I might have rolled my eyes a little. <laughs> and I will also say I, in conversations with a lot of my colleagues in international development, they might have done the same. And I think the reason for that was, the immediate reaction was another acronym. A potentially another USA requirement for us. I will admit, though, um, as the years have gone by and as we've dug deeper into CLA, I think we've really seen the purpose and the value of it. Um, in fact, what we have done is we've infused CLA into our monitoring, evaluation, and research. Uh, and that's essentially the genesis for MERLA. Um, 
Last year, what we did was, with support from our executive leadership, we put together a Merla community of practice that essentially brought together, for the very first time, uh, m &E specialists, researchers, program management specialists, admin specialists from across our organization um, into one community of practice. And we often call it our beehive. If you think of it, it's folks coming together from various countries, from various projects, across various technical sectors, really sharing and talking about the work we are doing in the monitoring, evaluation, research, learning space. Uh, and this cross-pollination uh, and this, and this cross has been of immense value to us. Um, one of the discussions that came out as a result of this cross-pollination was, well, we cannot be the only ones thinking about how to use CLA better in our work. Um, and we decided to hold this uh, essentially a, le uh, a learning event where we would bring together experts in these, in, in these areas. Um, in order to talk to us about, well, what is CLA? How do we do it better? How do we do it now? Um, and where do we go from there? Um, so without much further ado, uh, I'd like to kick us off um, um, into all these exciting topics. Uh, no pressure, panelists. It's a huge turnout. Uh, I think everyone's really, really excited about these topics. Uh, and I'll start by introducing our keynote speaker, uh, a very dear colleague and fellow University of North Carolina Tar Heel, uh, Heidi Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so Heidi is the project deputy director and director of evaluation for the major evaluation project, uh, which many of us in this room are probably well familiar with. I pretty much started my career, I think, using a lot of your tools. So thanks for that. Uh, um, over the last 20 years, major evaluation has improved data collection and capacity for evaluation and research throughout the world. Currently, the project focuses on strengthening health information systems uh, and capacity for evaluation uh, along with improving health outcomes for diseases like HIV AIDS, TB, and malaria in over 35 countries. Heidi leads the project's learning agenda, um, which essentially is designed to generate evidence about how to strengthen HIS. Uh, and she is herself an expert in evaluation, health, and information systems, health services research, and health service integration. On a lighter note, if all of you think that this is all that Heidi does, um, she, uh, you know, in addition to leading one of the world's largest evaluation projects uh, and framing its learning and adaptation, she also uses learning and adapting in her personal life as well. Uh, not to go into too many personal details, um, but Heidi has been an active CrossFit member and recently, unfortunately, had a bit of an injury. And she used that time to pause, reflect, and adapt. <laughs> and she is now contemplating switching gears and moving to swimming, something she did competitively in her college days. So it applies to our personal lives as well, right? So uh, needless to say, Heidi, when you dive into that pool, we'll all be rooting for you. And now you have a huge fan base here. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Heidi, uh, and invite you to share your learning and adapting story with us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rajiv. Um, yeah, I am in a big period of adapting right now um, after a big fall this weekend. Um, so I'm learning, you know, to, to take on new challenges. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everybody, to RTI for hosting this event. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I have already, we've already had some really interesting discussions. And I, and I think even just based on the turnout um, here today and online, I hear there are also a number of people. Um, you know, we, we see that there's clear support for implementation of collaborating learning and adaptive practices particularly in our field, largely because of the leadership of USAID and Stacy, we get to hear from today too, thank you. Um, but I was wondering when I was preparing this talk, like is this, uh, you know, where, is this just a, you know, sort of popular now, is it, are we at the beginning of something new? Or are we, you know, what, how, is this gonna maintain and continue? And certainly we've seen that kind of pendulum swing uh, in the Measure Evaluation Project. Um, measure Evaluation actually started out in 1991 as the Evaluation Project. It was designed to build the evidence base for family planning programs. 
Um, the actual measure evaluation project started in 1997, um, and there were two phases, phase one and phase two, that ran through 2008. And during that time, we saw a pendulum shift more toward monitoring and evaluation, capacity building, using data, um, and also the, the emphasis uh, expanded from family planning into other health areas. With the launch of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in 2003, that also affected our work greatly. We saw a big increase in demand for indicators, uh, for numbers to be accountable to Congress, um, and to build capacity for monitoring and evaluation. Um, in two, measure evaluation phase three, run from 2008 to 2014, still had a great emphasis on monitoring and evaluation and using data to improve programs. Um, but in, uh, in the middle of the project, we see a tilt back toward evaluation as a priority, uh, largely due to the publication of the USAID evaluation policy in 2011. And we started to see a large increase in demand for evaluations from the missions at that time. But this, this demand for more evidence was preceded by other um, events as well. I think many people are aware of the Center for Global Development report, When Will We Ever Learn, that came out in 2006, that had a, a strong call for be better evidence-based development programs. Also, many of you are probably aware that the Pol Bureau for Policy Planning and Learning was established in 2010 to, quote, catalyze USAID's transformation into an effective learning organization. There was other support coming out of um, important um, studies at the time. The Government Accountability Office and the Institute of Medicine had evaluations of PEPFAR that called for greater evidence in their um, HIV prevention and treatment programs. And in addition to um, learning theme uh, coming out of policy planning and learning, there was a, uh, you know, a memo from the Office of Management and Budget that also um, promoted evidence and learning within the context of U.S. government programs. And then, but, and then it sort of seems like the pendulum is starting to speed up because it's only in then 2017 that PEPFAR is backing away from evaluations, particularly impact evaluations, citing them as being too costly, um, the timeliness of those data not being what people would like. Um, yet at the same time, PEPFAR is calling for short learning loops, promoting data use um, it, within the context of programs. So I think it's important that we you know, not set aside any particular learning, um, f learning framework or learning um, design or approach, um, and that we have a lot of different ways that we can go about in our learning. And I really do think that we are at a point in time where we're seeing, I think, just the front end of learning. And, and I think we really will see um, a lot more use and integration of it. And I think this is a, a perfect starting point for that, um, that conversation. In 2014, uh, measure evaluation phase four started. Um, it was the first time that we had a learning agenda. We um, were given it our learning agenda in our cooperative agreement. So as many of you know, on day one of a new project, you're going at 100% and you're doing everything. You're, you're, you're trying to write and finalize your work plan. You're trying to finalize your M&E plan. Um, we'd always had a PNP, a performance monitoring plan, and an M&E plan, but now we're also trying to write a learning agenda. And it's kind of backwards. We should have started with a learning agenda, defining what that is, um, having um, the activities and the m and sort of feed into that. Um, so this is another sort of um, image that we like, which is this, this notion of uh, building the boat as we sail. Um, and my colleague... Kathy Doherty found this poem. She's also helped me with these beautiful slides. Um, the, the first fear of being drowning, the ship's first shape was a raft, which was hard to unflatten after that didn't happen. It's awkward to have to do one's planning in extremis in the early years, so hard to hide later, sleekening the hull, making things more gracious. Um, and so we really uh, grasp on that and feel like we're, we're building it as we go. Um, so with a swinging pendulum and a ship under sail but not yet built, we did devise a learning agenda um, in the first year. And we, we came up with these questions. What are the characteristics of a strong health information system? What are the stages of progression to a strong health information system? And what are the factors and conditions of health information systems progress? So it really is sort of a traditional learning agenda. We have these large overarching questions that we're looking to answer over the course of a five-year project. 
Um, we had to struggle to come up with these questions. We did a lot of iterating and reflection on what we really wanted to answer. Uh, we also struggled with the fact that this was not a research agenda. It was a learning agenda. So we not only needed the questions that we were answering, but the systems in place to try to answer them. And our learning agenda was designed to respond to USAID's request for information about what their investments in health information systems strengthening was doing. So they were very clear about why they wanted a learning agenda and because they wanted to know what their investments were giving. Um, health information system strengthening, I don't presume all of you are experts in that area, um, but it's not been traditionally an area for rigorous study and evaluation. It's, a, it's an implementation, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of technology and, um, that people think when, that they recall when they think about health information systems. So most of us who work on measure evaluation, as you can imagine, we're evaluators, we're researchers, we're M&E specialists. We love theories of change. We love logic models. I admit I still love the logic model. Despite its linearity, it's very clean. I like it the way it helps me organize my thinking. Um, but we didn't want to start from scratch with our learning agenda, and, so, and, we, and we did feel it was important to have a framework. So we started dividing, designing our health information system strengthening framework. And we didn't start from scratch. We built on, we looked around what was out there and built very heavily on the WHO um, health metrics network work. Um, so this is another theme that we particularly like, it, like it's, and I've used it before, it's this notion of standing on the shoulders of giants. And the idea is, is that you can, if you stand on the work of those people who come before you, you can see further, you can go further. And it's also a notion that we bring to our work every day. We don't want to Measure, we don't want measure evaluation to go away. I don't want to walk off the stage and for it all to fall apart, right? Like, so who's going to be standing on our shoulders when we're done or when we are, you know, who do we pass this on to? Who's going to go, go forward? So somewhat this notion of sustainability, how do we build on what we're doing? How do the people, how do we build it in a way that who comes next can build on our work? So one of the main ways we're doing this um, is we've established a website, and it's called the Health Information System Strengthening Resource Center. And it's where we are housing all of our results, learning, work, progress um, for the public. Um, it is, um, uh, as you can see here, we even have the questions um, are, um, that we can go, you can go into and see where we are in answering them. Um, they're not, uh, you know, it is a work in progress. And this has been one of those things that's been harder for us is to put stuff out there before it's perfect, before we're ready to have it out there. Um, we don't wait until it's, the, the, until it's final to get it done. Um, and this is a way that hopefully we can get more input and reaction uh, from the public in terms of how we're going about doing it. What do people, is it resonating with people? Um, even can they navigate the website? So it's all across a gamut of feedback that we're looking for. Um, and this is, you know, and, and USAID has been asking for this. They want, they want, to, they want updates. They want to know what the progress is. Um, they want answers faster than we're able to give it to them. Um, and so we're working to find ways to do that. Um, and so hopefully this will be a portal where we can um, eventually like house that and it become a global good that can uh, remain after if we, if we, if we go away. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our learning agenda and how we go about implementing it, but I think it's important to start, talk about the context that we're working in. Measure evaluation is a large, global, and we're very complex project. Um, we work in over 40 countries. We have um, over 70 small awardee partners in countries. We've got over 300 active activities going on at any one time. We've got funding from USAID uh, headquarters. We get funding from missions. We have associate awards. We have fundings from outside the Bureau of Global Health. And so if we're trying to, if we're tasked with this idea of trying to respond to USAID and ask what are the investments of USAID yielding in terms of strengthened health information systems, we have to look across all of this. So it's, it's very complex. So we have taken a more centralized approach to our learning agenda. Um, and, and trying to find ways and put in systems that we can gather learning from this um, very complex project. So we are less oriented to pushing out learning into the, our field programs, um, and that's something I'll talk a little bit more about, like whether we should be doing that, how do we do that. And I totally look forward to a lot of you who are doing that to find out how to do it. 
In implementing our learning agenda, we uh, are fortunate that we are a centrally funded project, so we do have some funding that we can put toward activities that help us answer the learning agenda questions in addition to implementing systems that help us draw learning from the activities that are being implemented in the field. Um, we have taken on um, sort of a continuum of different um, activities to learn. On one end of the continuum, we have some rigorous studies that are longitudinal, take several years, cost more money. But because they cost more money, we can only do a few of them. On the other end of the spectrum, we've tried to implement um, activities that gather information about health information systems in a little bit more rapid manner. We've taken um, indicators of health information systems performance and populated them for 40 countries. So we have pro country profiles for 40 countries. Um, and we gathered that information by talking to people, look, finding out what we could on the web. Uh, one of those lessons learned is it wasn't actually as easy as we thought it was going to be or as rapid as we thought it would be. But the notion is there that a lot of it, we engage in different um, activities that have shorter or longer, longer learning loops. Um, also at headquarters, we are working to do more synthesizing of our information and making sure that our products are um, visually appealing, um, short. Um, and again, it's not been that easy. It's such a complex project to distill something down into two pages, but we're trying. Um, another thing that we have is a management information system that allows us to get updates in real time. Um, it's, a, it's been um, a system that we've been developing over the years. And, in theory, we can get updates from all of our activities in real time. Now, there's the limitation is the people who are supposed to be putting in those updates in real time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll delve a little bit more into the human factor um, a little bit later. Um, but, um, you know, so we do have some systems in place that allow us to get um, learning in different, different ways. So over the, over the four years we've been implementing our learning agenda, we have learned a lot. Um, it is, um, again, as I mentioned, more of a central initiative. Um, it, it can be extra work for the people in the field um, while we try to engage them in, in our work and, and, pu and pull them in, ask us, give, give feedback, um, respond to things. They, we have asked people to um, apply the framework in their work. Um, it's still, it still is extra work, I think, at times for people in the field who are implementing the health information systems activities that USAID is asking them to do. Um, people in the field, if you're implementing a health information system, you're often doing very, uh, you're doing work like building, a, a, building out your DHIS2 platform or coming up with a data visualization scheme. So in the work that we're asked to do in the field, there isn't so much learning built in. So USAID isn't necessarily asking our, pro our programs to, to have a learning component. We, we, and I have also mentioned this, that we have not necessarily pushed out a learning component to the field. It's still very deliverable driven, and our work plans, are, particularly in the field, are still written in a way that's very much like, these are the things you will accomplish by the end of the year. Um, so there's more room there to, I think, improve and think about ways that we can integrate learning um, into those practices. And so I also want to bring it even closer to the people that, that are benefiting from, hopefully, this work. So who are we doing this learning for and why? And I think, so one of the things is this image of like the, the beneficiaries of our work. Like how can we bring learning practices to help their work? So we go in a lot of times and, and ask this guy to transition his, um, his work from this paper form that he's been using 10 years into something in a computer that maybe he's not as, as familiar with. Um, and while, you know, and how do we make that, do that in a way that then it's sustainable? Like, so all those investments just don't go away after Sam Wabu leaves. I don't know if any of you know Sam, but that's Sam in the picture. Um, and so I think that it is um, a responsibility of ours to figure out how do we pull learning into our work in the countries so that our work can be more sustainable over time, um, and so that people who are learning these new um, ways of doing their information systems um, can understand it and, and grab onto it and buy into it. Um, 
Did you know that the half-life of a cell phone app is six months? So after six months, more than half the users leave. So the technology is turning over very quickly. The people who are using the technology, the people who are responsible for filling in the numbers, reporting those data, they're there. They've been there for years. Even if they do leave, there need to be systems in place so that they can be trained, so that they have supervision, so that they understand the tools that they are. So again, this notion of short and long learning loops, and they have to work together. Okay. One more slide. So um, I do think that our, our learning agenda has helped us at Measure Evaluation elevate our work um, into being more of a science about how to strengthen health information systems. We do want to be building the evidence base about what works to strengthen health information systems and have practices in place to do so. We also, um, you know, in, in trying to understand what are packages of interventions to strengthen health information systems. Um, I don't think our boat is quite as sleek as these up here, but we're on our way. Um, and then there are things that we can do better. As I've mentioned, I think we can do a better job of pushing out learning practices, at least to our field offices, and also thinking about how to bring them to the people who are implementing those health information systems in the field. And most of all, I think um, that we sort of on the other end of the spectrum is this probably the how do we think about this largest learning loop of all, which is the learning about learning. And this is why I'm so excited to be here today, because I would fully expect to learn as much from you today as I hope I may have conveyed here. And so um, I am going to stop there and turn it over to you so we can talk more about learning about learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Well, you will definitely have your opportunity to ask Heidi as well as our other distinguished panelists questions. So I'd like to invite our panelists um, up to the stage, including Heidi. And yes, if anybody um, in the back would like to fill in the chairs up here, please do. All right. Okay. So, um, you know, what we decided as a, as a group, really, as um, panelists and planning committee, is that the best way to learn is to talk and to discuss and to have, you know, really candid conversation. And you were all part of that conversation. And so, um, what we'll do now is. Um, We'll give an introduction of our panelists and have them um, also share their perspectives, their experiences, so you can get to know them a little bit better. And then afterwards, uh, we have a few questions, um, and we will open it up to Q&A for the audience members here, as well as um, those of you that are joining us by webcast. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce um, Stacy Young. Stacey Young is a senior learning advisor for USAID's Policy Planning and, Bureau, uh, and Learning Bureau, where she leads the agency-wide collaborating learning and adapting effort to increase the effectiveness and impact of USAID's development efforts. We are extremely excited to have her here because through Stacey's vision, thought leadership, and team building over the past eight years, USAID has developed a holistic approach to CLA one that is increasingly integrated with USAID's policies and programs, and is both informing and informed by collaboration with USAID implementers and stakeholders. When Stacy is not engaged in deep philosophical contemplation about CLA, she enjoys listening to podcasts while walking her three-legged dog around her neighborhood in DC. I didn't get the name of your dog, sorry, but. Of course. So Stacy, Thank you very much. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly and Rajiv and everybody else for organizing this. Thanks, Heidi, for a fabulous keynote. It was really interesting and exciting. Um, it's a real privilege to share the stage with such effective leaders and, uh, and to be in a room with such amazing champions of, of organizational learning. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about how CLA got started. So I'll do a bit of that. This will be a, a sort of a quick sprint. And if you have other questions about that, uh, we can get to it in the Q&A. Um, 
and then I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the challenges, and I think we'll circle back around to the tools and approaches piece a little bit later. Uh, so, um, uh, as all origin stories are, this one is flawed and incomplete. Um, and all of you, I'm sure, have your own um, perspective on how CLA has evolved in your work and the ways that you, your work has contributed to that. Um, but I'll do my best from my own limited and partial perspective. Um, so uh, I had been working at USAID since 2003 on knowledge management and learning in the Economic Growth Bureau, uh, really learning how to help people generate and share learning and how to apply that in their programs to make their programs more effective. Um, that work began in the Microenterprise Development Office and then it, it branched out to other parts of the Economic Growth Bureau and then other parts of the agency. Uh, and in parallel with other knowledge and learning efforts that were taking place in USAID in a number of sectors, um, including a, a robust effort from the health sector, I want to say, and several people here have been involved in that for a long time. Um, around 2010, the new PPL Bureau was stood up, as Rajiv mentioned in his introduction, and um, the there arose an opportunity uh, as part of this broader effort to sort of reinvigorate the discipline of development and restore to the agency some functions that had fallen by the wayside in terms of uh, country-level strategic planning, evaluation, and so on. And um, as often as the case, uh, the, this work began with relationships and connections. And so... Um, I had been working for a long time with Tony Pryor, who has long been a leader in this space, in knowledge and learning, communities of practice, and so on, at USAID. Uh, and uh, Tony had been working on the implementing side on the work that I had been leading um, from the Economic Growth Bureau. Uh, Tony had been tapped by Dave Eckerson, who was another leader in USAID, and was heading out to Uganda as mission director to help that mission with its uh, strategic planning work. Uganda had been chosen as one of the, the missions to pilot a new approach to strategic planning. Tony brought me into conversation with him and Dave because he saw the potential to infuse the new strategic planning approach with a strong focus on knowledge and learning. And so Tony and Dave and I had several conversations about what that might look like, and Dave invited Tony and me to work with the mission. And so Tony and I made a number of TDYs out to Uganda, and uh, Tony led an effort with the mission to craft and refine an approach to strate strategic planning at the country level, and I led an effort to infuse knowledge and learning into that, and that became uh, what we now know as collaborating, learning, and adapting, with uh, USAID Uganda uh, being the first and lead mission in that effort, but a, a number of other missions picking up as we went. Um, so uh, that, was, that was the opportunity to really begin to take this work agency wide. The impetus for that, though, was something that we all share, which is that desire to do better development. And I really want to underscore that because, as I often say, if you're doing collaborating, learning, and adapting for its own sake, please stop. <laughs> the point of it is better development. If you're not doing something that is directly connected to improving organizational effectiveness, and development outcomes, then we just don't have time, do we? Because there are so many things that we need to be doing. So the impetus was uh, to help people chart a, a more direct path um, from their passion around development to actually achieving development outcomes and, and removing obstacles along the way. There was a, a broader impetus, I think, or a broader enabling condition underway as well, and that is the shift that we've all been experiencing for a number of years now, away from a sort of traditional linear lockstep approach to planning and implementing toward what we now know and understand as adaptive management and systems approaches. And CLA obviously is informed by and informs adaptive management and and systems approaches to international development. And so that, that broader context um, was both enabling and um, 
uh, has been enabled, I think, in, in our part of the world by CLA. Uh, so having piloted this effort with USAID Uganda, we continued to work with a range of USAID missions, learning from them about what this can look like in practice. We then um, codified the approach in the CLA framework, which um, you have or you can have. Uh, they're out on a table outside. They're also on the Learning Lab website. Uh, and the key concepts that crosswalk to the six components and the 16 subcomponents of what is really a, a holistic, a systemic approach to organizational learning in a USAID context, but also translates to other contexts as well. Um, and is it, the way that we use that is against a maturity model. So uh, the notion is not that you're doing it or you're not, but that everybody's doing some part of this. And um, one of the things that we need to figure out is where we might do a little bit more of something or something else in order to be more effective um, in our development work. So um, back at the ranch, back in, in PPL, we then set about infusing CLA into policy guidance, and we embarked on a really broad capacity building effort across um, many parts of the agency to um, help, uh, help this work take hold. Um, so I want to give a quick shout out to members of the CLA team. Um, uh, present and past, because this has never been a one-woman effort. If it had been, you would not have heard about it. Um, so uh, there's always been a strong team behind this. And currently, uh, those team members include Lane Pollock, Monica Matz, Christine Gandomi, Rena Nadler, Chelsea Jacquard Kaufman, our newest member, Christine Obester. Past members include David Ratliff, Lauren Hinthorne, Joan Whalen, Travis Mayo, Zan Larson, and of course, Tom Sinclair, who co-led the effort with me for a while. And there have been many other champions and collaborators within USAID, including our our own dear Zachary Bucket, who's at jury duty today instead of on this panel. Um, equally important has been the support side, so the, the implementing partners who have worked with us to refine this effort, and that goes way back to 2003, 2004, um, when we were uh, building this work through um, AMAP with QED and IRG. Um, and Jennifer's here, and Dar, and some other folks who've been involved in that, and then through the KDMD and the KDAD projects, and then uh, for the past three and a half years, um, the DEXAS Learn contract, that's Piers Bocock's team. Um, Amy Leo is also here, and others. Um, so I, I just mentioned these people because they have been excellent collaborators and champions, and have been absolutely integral to the growth and evolution of CLA at USAID. So just a, a few words on challenges. Um, Heidi mentioned time, and, and you talked about how um, the learning agenda that you're pursuing does require additional time. There's no getting around to that. We try to minimize that by focusing on existing processes that people are already spending their time on and making those processes more effective by making them better collaborating experiences, uh, more effective learning experiences, focused on problem solving and figuring out how, how we adapt and so on. So if you're already investing your time in a portfolio review, for instance, how do you make that more of a learning event? How do you make a partner meeting more of a learning event? Um, nonetheless, time is of the essence. Uh, it's in very short supply. Um, and certainly from the USAID side, there are a number of <laughs> bureaucratic processes, which if only we could streamline, we could free up sometimes. We're also always looking for ways to um, use our time more effectively so that we have more time for collaborating, learning, and adapting. Leadership support has sometimes been a challenge. Some leaders have really grabbed onto this and um, led the way. Uh, so I mentioned Dave Eckerson, Leslie Reed, Mark Messick, a number of other leaders, Karen Freeman, and so on. Um, but uh, it, it isn't always intuitive for every leader to understand their role in setting the tone uh, for a learning environment, making the space, dedicating resources, creating that enabling set of conditions uh, in, their, in their mission, um, and, and other leaders in other parts of the agency. So sometimes that's a, that's a bonus, other times it's a challenge. Um, skills in appreciative inquiry and facilitation and also in relationship building are really important to this work. Those are sometimes also a challenge. We don't necessarily hire for those skills at USAID, nor do we build them systematically across the organization. 
Um, so that can be a challenge. Where we find people with those skills, we grab onto them and, and work with them. Um, sometimes resource decision makers ask for evidence. What is the evidence that collaborating learning and adapting makes for better development? And by evidence, sometimes we default to a rather narrow definition of what that consists of. And so we've been working in many ways, including through our evidence base for CLA work stream about which you can learn more on uh, the USAID Learning Lab website, to uh, both build a base of rigorous evidence around the contribution that CLA makes to organizational effectiveness and to development outcomes, and also widen the ways that we define evidence and how we think about what counts as evidence, especially with interventions like organizational learning that are several steps removed from the ultimate outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, and then finally, I would say, uh, and again echoing Heidi, one other challenge that we really need to grapple with more fully, I think, is doing a better job of listening, hearing, leveraging pers perspectives from our intended beneficiaries and figuring out the answer to that question, learning for whom? How do we catalyze learning for the people who we're trying to help? How do we help them take the driver's seat in defining and implementing their own development agendas? And how do we learn a different relationship with them so that we're facilitating those processes with them? So I'll leave it there for now, and then we'll come back, I think, to the tools and approaches question later. Thank you so much, Stacy. Um, and I will say, when we first started chatting with Stacy, I admitted that I'd been following from afar and um, was just so excited to you know, speak with her, and um, you know, it's given anyone who's working in monitoring, evaluation, and research, especially in this field, just quite a new meaning of you know really helping our projects and our beneficiaries look at data. And so, so excited to hear um, what else you have to share with the audience. So, thank you. So, our next speaker, or our next panelist, is Tara Sullivan who leads the Knowledge Management Program at the John Hopkins University Center for Communication Program. She is the director of the Knowledge for Health, k for health project, and teaches in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is an expert in knowledge management and has led the effort to build frameworks for knowledge management program design, implementation, and evaluation. She led the design of tools such as the Guide to Monitoring and Evaluating Knowledge Management Programs for Global Health to help us build the evidence and better understand what works and what doesn't in the world of knowledge management. When Tara is not contemplating what additional knowledge management approaches and tools she can dazzle us with, she loves to spend time reading, doing yoga, dancing, watching her kids play soccer, and running, no pun intended, a youth summer track program. So it's with great honor I'd like to welcome Tara thank Sullivan. You. Thank you, Molly. Um, and thank you to our organizers, Rajiv, Molly, and RTI International. Um, I, too, really appreciated Heidi's opening remarks. I worked on the Measure Evaluation Project at the very beginning of my career, so I've been a huge fan of their work and have been following it for a long time, as with Stacy's and CLA, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Easter and her perspective on the Philippines. Um, before I get started, I did want to note that I am going to talk about my work from a knowledge management lens. I know we're talking about learning a lot, but I think knowledge management is really just that enabler that we need for our learning and adaptation work. So if I'm talking about knowledge management work, it's because we're, I'm coming from the perspective I'm working on the, the largest um, the flagship project for USAID on uh, knowledge management for family planning. So that's my frame of reference. Um, so I guess I wanted to kind of take us back. Um, the planners had asked me to really talk about my journey from a measurement perspective and really looking at how we measure our KM work. And when I came to this field about almost 15 years ago to the day, actually, um, I had, as I said, had come from the measure evaluation project. That was the first job I ever had. And of course, working in that arena, as Heidi so eloquently said, there's many indicators, there's frameworks, there's guidelines. It's very clear where, you know, what are your inputs, your processes, your outputs, outcomes, et cetera. But those types of, that type of guidance didn't exist in the field of knowledge management at the time. And so I, along with colleagues from the Global Health Knowledge Collaborative, 
decided, well, I think we better put something together then. <laughs> so that has been the journey that we've been on. And I know Molly had mentioned the guide that we had produced. So this is the guide if people have seen it or not seen it. Um, it the first iteration, I think, was in 2007. This is the 2013 version. So our goals, really, when we were developing this guide was really to bring together a community of practice that was, developed, that was interested in the monitoring and evaluation of KM programs as they related to our global health um, and development work. And we were interested in looking at how can you know, the KM activities that we're doing, how does that translate? into improved organizational performance. And also trying to look and see, well, even trying to tie that, make that connection to how does this connect to our global health and development work and how does it help improve some outcomes on that front as well. So the guide, if you've seen it or not, it describes how knowledge management activities really fit into our global health and development work. We did develop a common logic model, and I have to say I'm a big fan of logic models like Heidi is. I, I love the linear, I do appreciate the linearity of it. It does help me with my thinking as well. Um, so sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, and then we also developed a concise list of indicators. So at the time, because there wasn't any guidance, we came together, we talked about what indicators people were using, we vetted them, we, you know, of course, went through a long review process, et cetera, and so we came up with those in the guide. And then beyond that, we also um, provided some guidance and some instruments that people could use to develop, to measure those indicators that would also feed into the logic model that's presented in this guide. So that was 2013. Five years have elapsed since that time, and of course the field has evolved, and so too has the thinking on the measurement side. And so again, with colleagues from the, I always have to look at this name, the Global Health Knowledge Collaborative, it's not a hard name, but um, in this m &E task force, we came together again and we, we started scratching our heads and thinking, well, how has the field evolved and what ways do we want to really start thinking about measuring where the field is moving toward. So as we met as a group, we came up with three different areas where we saw the field evolving, where we thought we'd want to advance measurement. One was organizational partnerships. So I, th I think this really speaks to the collaboration part of our CLA work. Um, a second was really adaptive practice. So I think we're at a point in our field, um, broadly in health and development, where we're, we're talking about adaptive management, but we're also struggling with and learning how to uh, uh, effectively bring that adaptive practice into our work. So that's the second area that we looked at. And then a third area that we looked at, because you know, people are so important to our work. And, you know, Stacy was saying that we don't always think about how we can hire for people who are good at strengthening our relationships, but building those bridges and leveraging the people aspect of our work is really important as well. So there's a third bucket of indicators that we looked at and measurement around social interaction. So I'll briefly talk about, you know, break that down a little bit more. Um, and I will say that the format, you know, as time has evolved, so has our, the way that we're presenting this, we now have an indicators library. So it's a searchable library where you can go in and pull out indicators that are relevant for your work. So on the organizational partnerships front, um, there are three areas that we looked at in terms of being able to um, measure the strength of a partnership and its success. So one piece is just looking at the partnership structure. So it's like the management, the leadership, the processes that are put in place around a partnership. The second piece is partnership mutuality, um, which is looking at sort of that trust, satisfaction, willingness to contribute to and, con and work on joint activities together. And then the final piece is really looking at those outcomes of interest. So if we're going to come together in a partnership, what, what are the outcomes from that in terms of the value add to our partner organizations, to our stakeholders, and also to our beneficiaries? So the second bucket that we looked at um, and we've developed indicators around is adaptive practice. And the way that we looked at this area of work was really from a perspective of, well, we need to prepare ourselves for adaptive practice. We need to think about how we're going to reflect once we do get the information from our adaptive practice. And then how do we, from there, translate that into action? So there's those three buckets um, around adaptive practice that we've looked at. And then finally, there's the social interaction piece. So this piece is broken down into two different components. One is social capital, and the second is social learning. 
So from a social capital perspective, um, when you look at the literature, it's often broken down into three different areas, which is cognitive, relational, and structural. And when we're thinking about the cognitive piece, it's really thinking as we're coming together as a group, um, what is our shared vision or shared language that we have that can facilitate knowledge sharing and knowledge use? Then we also look at this relational piece, which is really looking at what are the norms around knowledge sharing, what is the reciprocity around knowledge sharing, for, exa for example, and how can trust facilitate our knowledge sharing and use. And then finally, there's a the structural component. And one of the things that we think about a lot and that we can really leverage for this work is our social networks. And so when we're thinking about knowledge sharing and learning, being able to think about ways in which we're connected to other people, how we can learn from other people, and how we can use our networks to really diffuse knowledge and accelerate our learning. So that's where we are today in terms of the measurement front. Um, we would love for you to check out the indicators that we've developed. We'd love to hear your feedback on it. It's, uh, you know, practicing what we preach. It's an iterative process, and we're, we're continually trying to take the feedback and fine-tune this work. Um, I guess I'd just close by saying that I, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but I think we all know that what measures gets, gets done, right? And so as we're moving into this, this field where we want to make sure that we're incorporating not only knowledge management activities in our work, but making sure that we're um, learning and adapting from um, those knowledge management activities that we're measuring what we're doing and we know how, how well we're doing in getting there. So um, thank you very much, and I think I'll, I'll close there. Thank you, Tara. Um, I will say that when we, as a planning committee, were thinking of who to invite and who would, who would be interested in this, I will say that you know, we as ME, as Merla specialists, were thinking about, well, what tools do we use all the time? In case you're seeing a theme here, we've got measure evaluation, um, CLA, USA Learning Lab, and um, certainly the, the, the tools that have come out of the K for Health Project have been just instrumental um, in our work. So, Tara, I think when we first met, I, I'd actually pulled up a very hard copy of your guide. I didn't even have a, I didn't even have a soft copy of it then, and I was like, can you send me the PDF of this? Because I, I would love an email copy. So, thank you so much for your work, and I'm um, excited to hear more from you. And last but not least, um, I have the honor of uh, introducing Easter Das Marinas, who is the chief of party for the USAID's Luzon Health Project in the Philippines, implemented by RTI International. She has over 30 years of global experience in the design and implementation of maternal and child health, family planning, and reproductive health programs in over 20 countries. She has provided technical expertise to local and global organizations in both the public and private sectors. Over the past couple of years, Easter has become what she refers to herself as a CLA convert. Under her leadership, the Luzon Health has embraced CLA as a cornerstone for programmatic decision-making and adaptations. When Easter is not drawing up strategies for how to improve <laughs> programmatic learning and adaptation in the Philippines, she loves shaking a leg on the dance floor and exploring new worlds through fun travels. With pleasure, I'd like to introduce Easter Das Marinas. Thank you, Molly. Uh, and thank you to Rajiv and Christina for inviting me to this symposium. I must admit that first I said, well, you're going to send me all the way or fly me all the way from the Philippines to Washington you may, to be one of the panelists. So, and, uh, but uh, to be honest, I'm very happy that uh, I accepted and I said, okay, I'll go. However, you know, it's 10.20 from where I come from, so if I started, you know, <laughs> becoming lost, you have to bear with me. Anyway, so uh, welcome to the field. So uh, let me tell you our story of how we got into CLA. So about two years ago, and this is after four years of project implementation, we came to a profound realization that while we were gathering data and learning from them, we were not doing intentional learning and adapting. To address this challenge, we had to shift gears. We were not, while we were not uh, having the intentional uh, learning and adapting, 
So we we took a more holistic and systematic approach, and we used Merla. This is uh, and we worked very closely with Rajiv, and this is the monitoring, evaluation, research, learning, and adapting. And through this application of Merla, we also augmented this with the CLA approaches. And a CLA was quite new, so uh, and one of our uh, one of our staff, I sent him to the CLA uh, orientation that was conducted by the mission. So, but uh, we were already talking about this based on the CLA approaches that we have learned actually from the website, and uh, so we augmented our existing programmatic programmatic monitoring and evaluation with operations le uh, research and learning best practices and approaches. To ensure that we were not only synthesizing our program learning, but also using it to inform programmatic adaptations, policy decisions, documentation and dissemination, both internally and externally with our partners and stakeholders. At that point in time, we also uh, developed our learning agenda. And I am happy to hear from Heidi that even Measure uh, Evaluation Project developed their learning agenda uh, later. <laughs> so I'll now talk about two examples of how using a comprehensive MERLA and CLA approach has changed the way we work and implement our project. The local government units that we work with were collecting and reporting a lot of data, but not meaningfully using them. Through the application of MERLA and USAID's best practice tools, we integrated pause and reflect and CLA workshops into the LGU planning to, to reduce and met need for family planning. Pause and Reflect allowed our provincial, regional, and municipal LGU partners, including the health service providers, to better understand variance in their performance data and also analyze performance trends across the municipalities and using their own data. And actually, this was a very good and very, uh, uh, if that, that was really a learning process for them because there were so many aha moments. So they said, huh, you know, why is our data like this? And then we said, oh, this is from your own data. So that was a learning process for them. So during this process, they started looking at, okay, so if you're only generating this number or serving this number of new acceptors, what what demand generation activity should we accelerate among the demand generation activities that we were using? And one of these is uh, they decided, or they identified and decided to accelerate or expand the number of uh, what we call USAPAN sessions. These are really uh, conversations among women who have been identified as having unmet need for family planning. So USAPAN is a group communication technique that links directly family planning service delivery with clients. This is not just like uh, conversations or information just to uh, increase awareness. These are really conversations that, they all, you know, like for example, and we have several variants of uh, USAPAN. So uh, we group together women who just want to space, you know, or those women who have already decided we don't want to have children anymore. And accordingly, we match that with the service uh, uh, providers. So as a result of this, we have seen a significant increase in the number of USAPAN sessions that have been conducted from 227 sessions in the last quarter of 2017 to 873 in the first quarter of 2018, and of the 6,161 who participated in targeted family planning variants, 
of these participants accepted a method. So that was really very helpful. Mm? Okay, our second example is around learning and adapting from our M&E and establishing the uh, technical evidence base. Again, through internal pause and reflect sessions that examined our family planning M&E data, we realized that uh, we had a lot of variance in family planning uptake among the methods. Specifically, it appeared from our M&E data that while a lot of mothers reported exclusively breastfeeding and assumed they were protected from undesired pregnancies through lactation amenorrhea method or LAM, the reality was that it seemed like women were in fact not protected. To get more concrete evidence, we designed a better recording tool in collaboration with our LGU partners and even the breastfeeding support groups for tracking the shift from family, uh, to family planning methods. Our results showed that by the sixth month after delivering a child, 87% of women no longer met LAM criteria and of this, only 31% had shifted to an alternative family planning method. So now we're highlighting these learnings through collaborative engagement with USAID and the Department of Health Regional Office, where our project site is, as well as the city health office that we're working with to understand how these learnings can be used to influence programmatic and policy decisions to ensure shift from LAM to other modern family planning methods. So these are two of our specific examples where we used uh, CLA and, and MERLA. And of course, uh, if you look at the matrix, you know, of course, that one includes collaboration, you know, and even at the service provider level, a lot of engagement with our LGUs. Uh, and in fact, uh, what generated from that engagement was also support in terms of resources from the Department of Health Regional Office. And, uh, and also even the city health officer, who was not really, uh, I think family planning was not really his favorite program, has now decided that I think there's a need for, for uh, some additional training in family planning of the service providers at the health center level. So. Thank you, Easter. Um, and I loved how you just said, welcome to the field, because, you know, when I think especially for those of us that are based in the home office, it's always, it's always just such a fantastic experience to work with colleagues in the field like yourself. And, um, you know, we, we love that you are a CLA convert, and we look to you for that leadership, really. So thank you to all of our panelists um, for that great introduction. So what we'll move into next is um, Q&A. And I know you're all burning with questions, but I'm going to start with just, we're going to start with just two. So um, our first question is, for those, for those of us who have come to understand the purpose and value of collaborating, learning, and adapting, how do we actually do it? What approaches, tools, and best practices in your experience have worked elsewhere to ensure that learning and adapting happen? So I might ask, Stacy to kick us off with that one. Well, sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Molly. Um, I'll start with approaches and then I'll get into some specific tools that we use at, uh, at USAID. So uh, these should sound really familiar to all of you. Um, so feel free to chime in and sing along. Um, <laughs> starting small and piloting is always really a good idea instead of going big with something that you haven't tested and then it, it fails. So uh, that, I think, has saved our bacon more than once. Um, and focusing where there's energy instead of uh, trying the hardest cases first, go with the natural champions, go with the um, low-hanging fruit, the, the ready opportunities to start from something that's already in place or um, a really uh, strong need with a lot of potential to improve our work. Um, building on early wins and bringing attention to those wins is really important. Helping other people see, hey, this actually is possible, it's not so hard, and look what good comes out of it. 
Uh, so that's really important. I talked a little bit earlier about relieving pain points and, and removing obstacles along the path between people and their desire to do good development. Um, that's helpful. Linking the CLA effort to the value that it creates and making sure that decision makers see the link. Sometimes they see the, the outcome, but they may not know what is behind it and what drove it. And so making explicit those links I think is really helpful to... Um, uh, galvanize the effort and galvanize support for it. Inclusivity is really important. Um, people want to be included in this work and they uh, want to see its relevance for their own efforts and their own priorities. Um, I mentioned before the, the cardinal rule, which is um, it, it's all about development. So stay focused on the development purpose behind the CLA effort. Make sure that your CLA efforts are supporting your development agendas. Um, uh, build on what's working. I think we talked about that. Resources are, are really important. Um, there were so many times when I was back in the Economic Growth Bureau working in knowledge and learning, building this, this nation program, and somebody would come along and say, well, I'm an intern. I'm here for three months. I have no budget. My director told me to come talk to you because they want me to set up a whole knowledge management program. And <laughs> so we would have a conversation about how unlikely that was and um, what they could manage to do in the absence of some really essential enabling conditions around resources. So resources are, are key. You know, I always um, tell people in our missions, knowledge and learning is, and, and collaborating, these aren't things that we can expect our implementing partners to do on uh, evenings and weekends. This is not anybody's hobby. We need to build those things into our funding agreements, into the scopes and the budgets and the staffing patterns and so on. Same thing for our own organizations. Um, and then, uh, sometimes in cultures that aren't all that enabling, uh, we can create more enabling conditions by uh, tying the CLA work that we're focusing on to the priorities of the leaders. I think that's often a good idea if you're trying to persuade somebody that this is relevant. Um, and then also finding champions to support those efforts. Um, finally, uh, amplification is really important. Sometimes it's hard for the people in our own organizations who are so caught up in the swirl of all of the things that we're trying to do to understand um, or trust the value of what we're trying to create. And it's easier for them to hear about that from the outside. It, it stands out somehow, or it is validating that it enhances the credibility of what we're doing. So, uh, so those are the approaches that I, I think have been quite useful in uh, growing and expanding this work, specific tools that um, our uh, mission programs use are, and, and these will translate to your own context as well, the portfolio review, uh, mid-course stock taking, these are, so portfolio review is something that happens every six or 12 months in the mission, um, making that effort a more learning focused effort, something that drives adaptive management has been really critical. It is a process that is widely loathed. It is widely experienced as not terribly useful. There's a lot of um, blame and shame that wraps around that process. I'm sure you can think of, of examples in your own context. So setting the right tone, using that as an opportunity to examine the culture of the organization and, and try to shift that a little bit, making that a much more useful effort for people. They're already investing time in it. They have to do it. It's required. Make it useful, and that will just open up whole new worlds. So that's been really important. Mid-course stock-taking is a once-in-the-course-of-a-five-year strategy major pause and reflect moment. There are other pause and reflect opportunities that we see missions building into their work and, and finding a lot of value in that, as, as Easter was describing on the implementing partner side as well. Um, learning agenda is really important. Um, being able to say these are the gaps in the evidence base, these are the, the things that we need to focus on uh, in order to do our work better. Um, supporting collaboration among our implementing partners. Uh, that's another thing that missions have focused on a lot. Uh, and, and then also recasting deliverables, moving away from the default 
um, that we don't really necessarily think about, you know, that, that hefty report that really has an audience of one, the AOR or COR, <laughs> and shifting that to something that is more of a ready-made learning deliverable that can be used in multiple settings and for a lot of different people to understand and, and grapple with the learning that's come out of implementation. So those are things that we see being used widely in our programs. Several of them are part of um, what is now required around CLA in the ADS as of September 2016. Um, so that brings me to the tools that we use internally uh, to support capacity building around CLA and USAID. Obviously, um, the ADS is one of those tools. The, the program cycle guidance in ADS 201, um, CLA was optional for a number of years as we tested and piloted and refined the approach and then became mandatory but still highly customized. So there are a few requirements and then a, a much broader invitation to invest in CLA where a mission feels it will have the most benefit. Um, adaptable funding mechanisms are another tool that we have invested in uh, jointly with our partners in OAA uh, within USAID, and, and those are really important to supporting adaptive management. Um, and then infusing CLA content into other agency policy guidance and trainings and tools, those are important. Specific CLA tools, the CLA framework that I, that I showed you before, and then uh, the CLA maturity tool that it is related to that. So that's how we use that framework with teams in USAID to self-assess and then action plan around uh, CLA. Um, the Learning Lab program, so, sorry, the Learning Lab site website, uh, which many of you are familiar with, we have a counterpart which is internal. It's called ProgramNet, and it covers the whole program cycle, including CLA. We have a CLA community of practice that's internal for peer learning. The CLA case co competition, the annual competition that many of you have participated in. Uh, we've got a one-week CLA training. We have a CLA toolkit that you can find on Learning Lab alongside our monitoring and evaluation toolkits. We recently launched a couple of podcast series. Um, we have an annual-ish event called Moving the Needle uh, and, and many others. But that, that gives you a sense of the kinds of tools that we use to build capacity. Thanks so much, Stacey. Um, does anybody else want to take that question? Or we can move on to the Tara, please. Happy to. Um, Thanks. So I can answer the question, I think, more from an implementing partner perspective. So um, when I was thinking about this question, I was more maybe thinking about tips that I, I might give to someone else, um, having been in this field for a while. And I think some of them definitely overlap with what you just said, Stacey. So when I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about how to incorporate knowledge management and learning into work, one of the things that I think I've learned over time that is important is, given that there might be resource restraints, time restraints, et cetera, that it's important to keep it simple. But I don't think that we should keep it simple at the expense of not being systematic. I think one of the things that I've seen over time is that sometimes people find that they're not seeing the results that they would like from their knowledge management and learning efforts, and it's more because it's ad hoc and not because it's been applied in a really systematic and intentional way. So that would be one tip that I would give. Related to that, I think I'll talk about tools at the same time that I'm giving tips, is that um, one product that we recently came up with, and this sort of similar to the journey in measurement was the journey in implementation of knowledge management programs, is that there don't seem to be a lot of guidebooks on how to do it and how to do it systematically. So our team at Cape for Health recently developed this Building Better Program Guides, which is really meant to help you throughout a project process. So it's a five-step process where we're talking about how you can think about identifying what your knowledge and learning needs are, developing activities to respond to those needs, and then monitoring and responding and eventually evaluating those through a five-step process. So this could help with the systematic piece of um, integrating knowledge management and learning into your work. Um, the second tip that I would give is um, make it interactive and fun. Um, you know, oftentimes when we're learning, we're in settings where it's a little bit more, 
you know, someone's talking at you versus with you. And I think that one of the things that we always want is to try to draw out all the knowledge in the room. And speaking of which, I'd love to hear from all of you with your experiences if we have time today. So one of the things that we've been trying to do as part of our programming that have been wildly successful is that we've been doing share fairs for a lot of our regional programs throughout the world. And, and a share fair is really just what you think. It's, it's a very interactive kind of activity where you bring together um, people who are working in a common field toward a common goal, so we're working toward those development goals, um, but doing it in a way in which people are really learning from each other. So we recently did a share fair in the Caribbean where people are working on those 90, 90, 90 targets. We had TED Talks. We had knowledge cafes. We had, I don't know if people have heard of liberating structures. There's a ton of really fun interactive activities as part of liberating structures. So we pulled all of those out. And, you know, if you look at the Adobe Spark presentation, which is a great way to disseminate what had happened at that event, it's everyone's ha is smiling, having fun, and interacting with each other. And a lot, of, a lot of knowledge was shared within that region. So it was interactive and it was fun. Um, my third tip would be to um, share your experience. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but just to give a, a quick example on that, in, in ways in which I think it's a development imperative, I agree totally with Stacy that we can't just be doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, there are limited resources, there's limited time. Working in partnership in, in, with others and sharing what we know, I think, is it's imperative. Um, so one of the things that we manage as part of the Knowledge for Health project is Global Health Science and Practice Journal, which, again, I think is a great resource if we're trying to really look at what we're learning. The, the purpose of the journal is really to kind of unpack that how of our global health programs. But the story that I want to tell here is one of how we shared our knowledge on developing that journal so that we could help another group develop an East Africa journal that used all the, re all the, um, uh, the processes that we had put in place, um, for everything from how do you develop, you know, get an editorial board, what staffing do you need, et cetera. So I think that it's really upon us to share our experience with others. And then, of course, um, given the topic that I have today, I would strongly endorse that we measure it. And I talked about those <laughs> tools. So... Thanks for the opportunity to answer that. Thanks, Tara. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go on to our second question, and then we'll open up the Q&A to the audience. Um, and Easter, I'll probably direct this to you, but others, please feel free to chime in. We talk a lot about learning and adapting, and us doing learning and adapting. And often, to be honest, it's, it's us in the US going out in the field and, and driving a lot of that learning and adapting. The question is, how do we build the capacity of in-country stakeholders, governments that we work in, local partner organizations that we work in, to lead their own learning and adapting processes? Yeah, so, uh, well, I think first, like us as a project, I think across project teams, that should also be clear. I think CLA, first, you know, it's at the project level. CLA doesn't really have to be, you know, uh, expensive, you don't need a lot of resources at that level. Even project meetings can use a friend, uh, pause and reflect. You just have to be deliberate with uh, your questions and the learnings that you know that uh, you want to generate. And with uh, our regional partners, for example, we don't really have to use to introduce the term at the uh, beginning the term CLA, because you don't have to introduce this like, oh, you know, like this is something new again, you know, what's collaborating, learning, and adapting, because there might be some resistance. You know, they might say that, hmm, we've been doing that before. So I think you have to uh, develop a process where uh, we build on what they're already doing, like collaborating, and then you can generate from them like, and then you say, oh, yeah, that's really collaboration. So uh, it's not really something completely new. You know, they have been doing this, or even us, you know, it's just like uh, you don't put them in that box, really, a CLA based, for example, on the concept and, and, and the tools. You know, it's the way they're doing things. And even on a day-to-day, -day, they will realize that, 
Yeah, the, yeah, you're right. This is CLA. And, and that is also the learning that we uh, got from doing the workshops. First, we, in, we started generating from them, you know, how do you do collaboration? How, you know, what kind of learning? Are there opportunities for learning? How do you adapt the learnings that uh, you have generated? For example, and one very important uh, element is really data. When you have, at the project level, you have to have a robust m and &E, you know, system because it really tells you a lot, you know. And uh, when, uh, like, and also at the, uh, with your partners, like when we introduced the CLA workshops of pause and reflect and using their own data, said, oh, you know, it's from us. We have that, but we have not been using it. And there were a lot of... Uh, mm, there were new insights, you know, that were generated out of that. And the second one is, I think, going through that process with our partners, we have to be very sensitive to, as uh, State said, the, the blaming and shaming, openness even within the project, you know, because, like, for example, if you have project staff that are assigned uh, to specific provinces, for us in our case, and we do, we use also the pause and reflect during our PIRs, and you see the variance in the uh, performance, then uh, you cannot help that, but sometimes they become defensive, you know, and it's the same thing when you work with the partners. So first, yes, you have to use data. It's very compelling when you have that information. Uh, the second one is, uh, yes, as I said, at the project level, you don't really have, that does not require a lot of resources because that's built into some of the activities or the interventions that you're already doing. And uh, the next one is also openness with your regional partners. And, uh, and, packaging the information let, later on. The CLA workshops that we have conducted with our partners was the, also a, a venue for feedback. This is, you know, this is what we have collaborated on. These are the results. Uh, so how do we move further? So it's really built on, I must say that even your day-to-day, -day, you know, management of the project and everybody within the project team, across the project teams, should embrace it. And, uh, well, it doesn't happen overnight, but uh, when you have that consciousness and deliberate effort to uh, use uh, I think it's very uh, it's very important. Um, if we do, we have any insights from anybody else? We can go on to Q and A. Let's let's open on to Q and I think I think people really want to ask questions. Um, we'll have uh, if you could um, raise your hand, and then somebody will come to you with a mic. Um, if you could just state your name, your organization, and then delve into the question. Thank you. I'll, I have four easy questions for Stacy. Uh, and one fifth that's optional, sorry. Um, yeah, you can choose which ones you want to answer. Okay. Um, first, can you say a word about local staff? Um, and I know that your, your chief of mission for Uganda was really key, but what about Ugandan or local yep. East African mm -hmm. staff were key? Introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, I'm Nanette Barkey. And um, the second question was, did you look at other donors? Because I know a lot of other donors are very flexible um, with uh, pause and reflect and learning. Um, and that kind of brings me to my third question, which is about one of the challenges that I didn't hear you mention, which is flexibility in USAID's cooperative agreements and contracts and whether you see that as a challenge. And then I also couldn't help but notice that everybody else is a health person except you. Um, and uh, these examples, and as a former health, as a health person, I guess I still am, uh, more M&E now, but... Um, do you think that this has particularly been taken up by people within the health field? And then that gets me to my fifth question, which is um, PEPFAR and Food for Peace, Feed the Future, whatever it is. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm a health person. Uh, how have they been in terms of uh, barrier or in terms of being helpful in the dissemination of CLA across USAID? 
Okay, uh, thank you for your many questions. <laughs> um, I'll do a, a very quick sprint. Um, I don't know why all the examples are in health because I feel like that's where we've made the least inroads in around CLA, but partly it's because of the work that you guys have already been doing around knowledge management and learning in health. Um, so in a way, it's a, a bit close to Newcastle on, on some of this. Um, but uh, in other ways, I think because of PEPFAR, many health teams are um, really marching to the beat of a different drum, which is much louder than <laughs> any drum we're ever going to be sounding. Um, it's somewhat similar in Feed the Future, although I'm so sorry that Zachary's not here to speak to that. Um, certainly in Feed the Future, they have embarked on an ambitious learning agenda, which obviously aligns with CLA. And we see a lot of um, CLA infusion, actually, in, in Feed the Future work, including in Uganda. Some of the best work that was most adaptive and drew on um, flexible funding mechanisms, which in fact I did mention um, as an enabler, but the lack thereof is obviously a challenge. Um, uh, it, yeah, uh, it took place in Uganda and uh, was led by um, local staff, um, including some really uh, fantastic local AORs and CORs who uh, totally took up the um, notion of adaptive management and infused that in, into work in Uganda. How am I doing? I've got three out of five so far. Um, other donors, yes. Uh, we have consistently, actually during the entire course of my time working at USAID, we consistently look to other donors and benchmark our work against them. We also collaborate with them. Um, most recently, Piers Bocock and I have been working on, with the help of Amy Leo here, um, a podcast series called Leaders in Learning, in which we interviewed 10 other uh, uh, donors and development actors um, who are leading in this space. So stay tuned for that podcast. Um, uh, we're also uh, working on a longer-term collaboration with other donors because I think we all see um, the need to um, learn from each other in this space. The challenges are, are the same, and uh, the ways that we're approaching it are slightly different, and so there's a lot of cross-fertilization, I think, that we can get to. Um, I mentioned, but I want to underscore your point about local staff. Local staff are obviously essential in the USAID context where we have built-in amnesia with this, the way that we rotate American staff in and out. Um, we do a lot of work on uh, work sort of on the enabling conditions side around um, helping to elevate and amplify the voices of local staff and, and their role. And um, certainly some missions are more conducive to that than others, but really trying to um, highlight examples where that is the case because uh, often local staff, you know, they've got lots of advanced degrees, they've got years and years of experience, they have the deepest contextual knowledge, uh, and they're the ones who are the most affected by these programs. They really need to be in the driver's seat. And so um, when we find American staff who are champions of that, we work with them. And when we find examples, we share that. Uh, it, specifically um, around things like the part of the CLA framework that has to do with institutional memory. Obviously, that's a place where uh, local staff are indispensable. But we also don't want to relegate them to just being the holders of institutional memory because they have such deep and important technical expertise as well. So yeah, that, that's absolutely essential. And I think as we move further into um, changing the relationships with um, our uh, host countries as part of USAID's focus on uh, fostering and supporting countries on the journey to self-reliance, um, we really will need to learn from and take the lead from local staff in understanding how we recast our relationships with the countries that we work with. So thank you. I hope that thank was you, concise. Stacey. Um, all right, well, if we're going to start like that, guys, I'm going <laughs> to limit you to one question per... <laughs> All right, next question. Hi, thank you very much. Um, my name is Dr. Mindy Reiser. I'm with an NGO that is doing many things. It's called Global Peace Services USA. I also wanted to call attention, I do have a question, that the Science and Human Rights Coalition of the American Association for the Advancement of Science actually is doing webinars on evaluation for human rights organizations. So go to the IIIS website and learn about that. My question is to Tara and to other folks. 
One of the essentials is trust. You, you um, underline that in terms of this whole process working. I don't need to tell you how complex the world environment is now with a real decline in trust and the competition for resources and all kinds of subversions along those lines. What are you advising your partners who may be working in governments where corruption is a byword, where ability to keep data confidential and gain the trust of your respondents is a possibility? The work that you're doing is important and admirable, but the constraints are huge. And how are you assuaging the fears, and the Philippines comes in here too, of NGOs who may be on the firing line for all sorts of reasons? That's a huge question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer it, actually. I'm thinking Heidi might have something to add to this as well. Um, just to speak to the, the issue of trust, um, when we're looking at trust, the, the context in which we're measuring it and thinking about it is as part of our collaborations, of course, and how we're building trust with our partners. I think from our perspective, it's um, building those relationships through coming together with common agreements, having those initial dialogues about, for example, we're always wanting to keep our development objectives in mind whenever we're coming together with our partnerships. So I think it's something that has to be, for us, to be built over time, built on mutual respect, of course, and having mutual agreement on the objectives that we're working toward together. I don't know that I can speak to the corruption issues based on my own experience, so I think I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues here and say if they have anything to offer on that front. Well, uh, I don't think I was in a position to talk about, you know, issues like that at the higher level. But, uh, you know, we work with service providers. We are at the service delivery level. So, as I said earlier, confronting uh, issues like underperformance, for example, require a lot of openness. And shaming and blaming, I think, will not help. So there should be a way of uh, bringing to fore what the, what the underlying reasons are for underperformance, for example. And uh, during the workshops, as I said, the aha moments where a doctor, for example, can learn from a midwife. Or even a manager, you know, or managers like us can even learn from uh, a community volunteer. So I think it's, it's uh, really having that uh, venue of exchange. And so it's, uh, and then they come out of it, they say that we're all in this together. And that helped a lot during our workshops, like uh, when we had the workshop on identifying uh, uh, what else could we do in order to, to accelerate or uh, increase the, or reduce, uh, for example, the unmet need for family planning. In the Philippines, there's now an executive order to reduce uh, uh, unmet need for family planning. And uh, the Philippine government, under the current administration, has also included uh, responsible parenthood and family plan and uh, reproductive health. And that's really family planning in the economic agenda. So there's really, uh, the, in the environment right now is ripe for, at the service delivery level, to accelerate, you know. So, so at the very level where, where services happen, I think it's very important, you know. That's where women go, you know, to the health centers. Women interact with health service providers, and that's where openness and flexibility, and uh, with flexibility, uh, adaptive management requires that. Openness and flexibility, and uh, being able to make those changes, even, uh, even we might think that there are minor changes, like for example, when we had a CLA for the regional medical centers. These are the tertiary hospitals, so aside from that uh, discussions and uh, analyzing their performance, so we brought them for, uh, to a hospital where they already made some, some changes. Like for example, there was a medical director who noticed that one hospital uh, 
the change, you know, that the Midwest, we will, we're going to have a fast lane for women who are in need of family planning services so they don't have to wait. So he said, oh, you know, that's an easy, uh, you know, that's an easy change that we can adapt. So even small things like that are very important at the service delivery level. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Well, I, would, I mean, I would try to answer it um, a little bit. I, um, my answer wouldn't necessarily be focused on the learning aspect, so I'll try to pull that in. Um, in the context of health information systems, it, it is a huge concern, the ethics of the use of the data, the privacy and the confidentiality. Um, and there's a lot of thought that goes into that. Um, a lot of the work that Measure Evaluation does is to support the work of the local ministries of health and others who are developing those policies and procedures um, and, and ensuring that the, the databases and other um, support tools um, ensure privacy and confidentiality, especially around you know areas such as key populations or others who there some may still be some laws in place that it, you know it could result in criminal action. Um, I think that it is a huge area of concern, and if if we pull it in from a learning perspective and look at it, and if we um, you know, some of those questions and concerns could be taken up in that learning context, you know, it, on, you know, by the people who are developing those systems and the ministries of health of, like, are we doing, are we doing a good job at this? Are people's privacy and confidentiality are really protected? And so I think those kinds of concerns can be translated into um, the learning context and, and you know, and, and followed and supported that way. Thank you. Thank you. And I've, we've got some questions from our um, webcast oh, as good. well, so please. Thank you. Yes, I would like to relay some questions that our webcast audiences are asking. Um, first, are there ethical review issues to be considered when generating learning collaboratively? And does evidence generated through this approach get peer reviewed and or published? Is that question directed to? Is open to anyone. Okay. <laughs> Anybody I can start, All and right, I think probably Heidi might have something to say as well. Um, so as part of the Knowledge for Health project, um, we are affiliated, of course, with the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication and Programs is affiliated with the um, School of Public Health there. And we do do research on our knowledge management and learning work because what, we, what we're attempting to do is practice what we preach. We want to really get an understanding of how our KM activities are translating into development outcomes. So we are doing focus group discussions. We're doing surveys with people who are working with, et cetera. And so from that perspective, we take the approach that I think any researcher would take. It goes through an ethical review board. Um, you know, of course, you need to do all the appropriate um, measures to make sure that you're protecting your respondents, which um, I think that many people in the audience probably already know this, but it's everything from coming up with good consent forms to making sure that you have good data security measures for the data that you're collecting, et cetera. And of course, the IRB is looking at the kinds of questions that you're, you're asking and how that can affect um, the safety of your participants. So of course, it is something that we do take into account as part of this work. I'm not sure if I answered that question directly, but that's what we do at K4Health. I mean, and I would add with the caveat is I'm not an IRB expert, but a lot of the work, so some of our work is, we, we do tend to put a lot of stuff through an IRB um, just so that we can, you know, check that box. And I don't mean that to minimize it at all, but it does help when, so a lot, because a lot of journals are, will ask, did this go through an IRB? Um, we do find that a lot of our work ends up being determined non-research, and this is because it's oftentimes used for program improvement. Um, and so in a lot of what CLA does, especially some of the work in a program, I think would be considered that, um, that it is work that you take the data and use it to improve your programs and therefore wouldn't necessarily be considered research. Again, not the IRB expert. <laughs> um, so I think it, it, there is, but there are really good um, you know, IRBs do have very good criteria for what they consider. Yeah, and just to add to that quickly, the same thing happens with us. It's, it's often considered, almost exclusively not considered um, research because it's more programmatically focused. So I think what we'll, we'll do is we will revert back to the audience and maybe, why don't we do maybe two, three, two, three questions, questions from the audience and then our panelists can get an idea of what's coming. Please. Thanks. And thanks for all the great presentations. I'm Michelle Koffenberger with the World Bank. 
And my question is around how do you think about um, formalizing some of the lessons that come out of these projects and these processes? And from where I sit, it, I sit in more of a central hub. So we interact with a lot of different projects and programs that might be engaging in a CLA type process themselves. But what I would want to do is be able to formalize those lessons that they're learning in a very local and very contextualized context, extract that, synthesize that to inform the design of future projects in other contexts. So for you know some of your Philippines examples, it's really easy to think about some of those lessons learned could very easily apply, say, to a project being designed in mm -hmm. India. So how do you think about that formalization process and, um, and, and getting that disseminated as well. Thanks. Why don't we just take maybe one more from the audience? Um, thank you very much. Ma Maureen Black from RTI. I enjoyed your presentation very much. And um, I, I particularly liked when you talked about building um, capacity within, within countries. Because at the end of the day, the donors leave. And at the end of the day, the idea is that uh, these are not just um, uh, uh, learning phases, but you're actually making a, a real change within that. So that's a bit of a prelude. Um, my particular interest is in um, uh, children. And that certainly starts in health as a critical aspect of young children. But then, then when we think about children developing, they become involved with other systems. So maybe a social security system, ultimately the educational system. So I wonder if you have examples of how CLA or the knowledge management has been helpful in terms of reducing the silos and enabling the, the health sector to work with the uh, educational system or with the social security systems in, you know, in meaningful ways that are sustainable. Great, thank you. So, why don't we open it up to our panelists. We can start with the first question about formalizing. If anybody wants. Go ahead, Heidi. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, <laughs> no, I would, I mean, I think that we struggle with a lot with that, um, you know, how do we pull, how do we learn and synthesize across um, at a central level? Um, and, I, and I mentioned in my presentation that I think um, it's a real, there are a lot of things we could be doing differently. But I really wanted to underscore this sort of looking at things that you're already doing that you maybe don't call um, CLA, that you don't necessarily call adaptive management because there are already practices in place. And once you identify them and you know, bring attention to them, they, that enhances it automatically. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some you know, easier mechanisms that we could do um, you know, integrating just learning statements into our work plans, into our trip reports, things like that, 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 that can allow um, information to be transferred, um, you know, from the people who are getting the learning on the ground to a place where it can be synthesized and shared across. Um, I think some of these regional hubs, and some of the idea of regional learning platforms and maybe is a really um, way to go. But it, you know, and it's always at the risk, though, and this is just something I can't get away from, of like not increasing the work burden on the people who are already overloaded really implementing. And I think that's, that's always going to be a challenge. Yeah, I, I would say um, from the USAID side, we use um, a mix of approaches. Um, and sometimes we refer to it as a spectrum of inquiry um, so that uh, we're looking at some sort of formalized um, codified assessment processes. We have required analyses at different points in design processes, whether they're at the country level strategic planning um, phase or in uh, project and activity design. Um, but we also try to catalyze peer learning because um, I think that typically our um, where we uh, find ourselves coming up short is not in access to formalized codified knowledge, but in actually having the time to engage with what it means and its implications for our programs and, and figure out how to apply that learning. So um, by, by spanning that range from formal assessment processes, formal evaluations, um, through monitoring, through uh, more sorts of peer learning. Um, clearly the CLA comp case competition is something that lies not on the most formal end of the spectrum, but does do a good job of capturing learning. Um, 
we we try to um, really you know uh, create a menu of um, analytic uh, efforts that that people can pull from depending on, on what's relevant and um, really try to build out the side of the spectrum that has often been neglected, which has to do with peer learning and, and interactivity and um, capturing learning in ways that might be more digestible, um, more easily used, and so on. Um, in terms of um, uh, examples of decreasing silos and enabling health programs to work cross-sectorally, I would again um, from our perspective, direct you to the repository of cases that we have from the CLA case competition on the Learning Lab website. We've got more than 200 cases there, um, and you can filter them. So some of them will um, come up as cross-sectoral programs um, where that, that um, cross-fertilization is taking place. But maybe others have mm -hmm. examples specifically to that question. Mm -hmm. If I can say also from RTI's perspective, I mean, we really this Marilla community of practice and um, I mean it came about as interested parties across different technical sectors that just wanted to talk about m and &E and kind of the challenges that we are working with within our silos um, and I think the community of practice has given us a forum and, and a really a safe, safe space to share practices and information in sometimes a formal way you know we have presentations from our colleagues that we absolutely learn from and we will adopt and adapt tools um, which are then used, uh, which, is, which has been instrumental in our work really. But I would also say the peer-to-peer -peer learning has been, at least for me, just, I mean, being able to reach across the institute and, and find examples that we can rely on. And I will, I will say something about the case, um, not just the case competition, but there was a CLA challenge week that we participated in and just through that, event alone, it was a week where you, you took on a challenge of how you would integrate CLA into your work. And we had individuals take on the challenge, project teams. Mm -hmm. And us as a community of practice, we said, how committed are we to organizational learning and really instilling this community of practice with a mandate and a mission to, to share tools and to you know, reduce inefficiencies and so um, I, I completely understand where these questions are coming from because we ourselves as a community of practice struggled and talk about these things all the time so thank you all right so I'm gonna be fair to the blue j to our webinar um, participants as well so hi I'm Elizabeth Reagan uh, also on the Merla team at RTI and I'm going to read out one of the uh, online comments from the webinar so I think this is probably directed at Stacy. What is the process for ensuring sufficient resource availability, both HR and funding, for changing CLA priorities in ongoing USAID-funded projects? For example, once an implementation plan has been approved. <laughs> OK. Um, can you read it one more time? Because there was an important word at the beginning that I... Yeah, missed. sure. What is the process for ensuring sufficient resource availability, both HR and funding, for changing CLA priorities in ongoing USAID-funded projects? So, for example, once an implementation plan has been approved. Okay. Um, so that word is ensuring, and <clears throat> I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, uh, yeah, it's a work in progress, right? Um, I think uh, ensuring, of course, implies a, a requirement, and where we are with respect to requirements for CLA um, is, uh, again, with the um, CLA shifting from optional to required in the ADS 201, that's the program cycle guidance, as of September 2016. And again, the requirements are, are light. There are four requirements. Um, and so those requirements um, Im imply a certain ability to resource against them. Um, one of them is uh, making sure that there's a plan for uh, partners to collaborate. Sorry? Yes, that one, okay, um, for partners to collaborate. So how this shows up is a topic of conversation often with mission staff trying to figure out what do we put into 
the RFP, the RFA, what do we put into the budget, what do we put into the statement of work, how do we make sure that it shows up there. And again, our, our um, OAA colleagues have been really excellent collaborators and champions in this and working um, with uh, contract and agreement officers in USA to make sure that those kinds of things show up there. Um, but yeah, we're not there in terms of ensuring yet. Um, uh, so we just try to share examples and um, in our technical assistance and also in the uh, small g guidance that we put out, um, really hit that note. Um, so that that's the program funding piece. The HR piece, um, that's a whole other layer. And again, I think we're less systematic with that than uh, we would like to be, less systematic than some, some other donors. DFID, for example, does a really good job of making sure that um, their emphasis on learning shows up in performance reviews. But we have seen, <coughs> excuse me, in, in the Foreign Service uh, compet comp competencies, a uh, stronger emphasis on aspects of collaborating, learning, and adapting. It doesn't show up as CLA per se, um, but there is a, a stronger emphasis on those behaviors than there has been in the past. Um, and then in terms of staffing, we see increasing uh, numbers of missions and other operating units hiring learning advisors. So um, seeing that there, that's a specific function and um, that they need to staff it. So they'll hire a learning advisor and or they will also add learning uh, functions and responsibilities to the, the M&E um, staff members, although sometimes, you know, we're talking about quite distinct skill sets depending on, on what the effort looks like. Uh, so sometimes that doesn't work as well in reality as it, as it does on paper. Other times it does. So uh, I think we're getting there. Um, still a work in progress. I could also maybe ask Easter, because as, as, as you'd mentioned earlier, Stacey, is that you know, one of the, I guess, you know, core pillars of really having a, an intentional CLA approach is having leadership support. And we've absolutely seen that in Luzon Health at a project level is you know, we went out with sort of an m and &E agenda research and, um, you know, for lack of a better word, converted, um, you know, a chief of party that, as she mentioned, I mean, midway in the program didn't know about CLA before and now is, is very intentional. So I think it'd be great to hear, you know, Easter from a, from a project standpoint, you know, how the resources that you've put in that you yourself have advocated for, you know, can maybe help some folks here learn about. Well, uh, at, uh, for Luzon Health, actually, it's really, uh, it's quite simple. You have to develop champions within the organization. It's, it doesn't only have to be you, you know, as project manager. Up to the, as I said earlier, everybody has to embrace it. And everybody has to understand what it means. And so when we did it, for example, we introduced uh, an orientation on CLA. It was not really like best job, you know, we have to do CLA. But looking at our internal processes and also external, you know, collaboration that oh, these processes, for example, in our work plan actually can be uh, under collaboration. So if you have to go through the checklist, they fit into what you're already doing. And then at the end, in summary, said, yes, we're doing CLA. There are just processes that probably are highlighted. And there are just processes that probably will say that we have to do more because this is not generating the results that we want. So you have to make uh, develop champions within the organization. And actually, we're also lucky because uh, the mission now has a project, you know, has a small project, CLA project, that the, the Office of Health, and they're really into this. In fact, just last week before I came, we had a CLA workshop. And uh, while we have already, and CLA is already actually part of our project description for the extension period. You know, it's, it, it has been deliberate on our part. It's part of our learning, for example. So, so probably uh, it's not at the um, very mature level yet, but really you have to start somewhere. And what triggered for us was really looking at our M&E data. You know, what does this mean for us? 
And it's been very helpful. Like, uh, for example, when we did the uh, CLA workshop, as, as part of our uh, collaboration with our partners, this is also front and center of the way we uh, do things. We really engage our, uh, the stakeholders and our partners, so even development of processes and products, we have to vet with them. So during that process, one of our uh, regional partners who heads also not only family planning, but maternal and child health and nutrition, said that, oh, you know, I think I'm going to use this process for the other uh, technical areas. And she did it. And uh, she said, you know what? I also downloaded the tools from, from the USAID uh, website, and I used this as a also as a tool for her PIR, for her program implementation review. So there are a lot of, I think, there are ways there where you can uh, uh, adapt you know, some of the tools without necessarily saying that we're doing CLA. You know, it's part of the project implementation at that level, yeah. So, so and uh, I think also CLA, the process could be used when, uh, it's disruption, you know. It's during those uh, times when, you know, people say that the performance is low and, you know, and uh, the have moments are not there anymore. And when you introduce a, a tool or a process, they say, yeah, I think, you know, this will energize us again or uh, we'd be able to do more. And uh, it's also the way, you know, like workshops or, uh, are facilitated, you know, as, and I agree it has to be fun, and at the same time, you know, it's a learning process for them. And I say also there's a lot, it's not only the learning, what is important is the unlearning part. You know, it's, uh, oh, you know, we have been doing this, but there are actually some other ways of doing this. Thanks, Easter. All right. Um, questions? Please. So we're going to take, okay, so we've got about five minutes, and we might take two more, and uh, please. Okay. Morning. My name is Lisa McGregor. I'm here um, w with RTI and the Governance and Economic Growth Team, but I used to be with USAID. So uh, what I see is really s some great movement on this idea of learning and adaptive management, some really interesting and innovative solicitations that are out. But there's really some significant contradictions um, in this process, and I just wanted to get feedback from the panel of how you're trying to overcome it. So a couple of you mentioned that you really like log frames, and I'm, I kind of have that personality too. But um, <laughs> you know, it's really hard to have a three or five year log frame and be adaptive. And honestly, I'm also seeing it even in the work plan and the reporting. So you have a work plan that's over 100 pages or reports that are 50 and six quarterly reports that are so long and complicated. So given that context, how do we really adapt? I hear you know, some really great ideas from our colleague from the Philippines, tweaking of programs. But if we're seeing a whole activity is not working, how, how are we really making significant adaptations based on what we're learning and the country context, the challenges you see on the ground? Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take one last question. I have a question that kind of piggybacks on that. I'm not a, I'm Adrian Benson. I'm, I'm with Mendes England and Associates supporting the Feed the Future Peel project. I'm not a male person, I'm a writer. So I'm the person who deals with those 500,000 page reports with all their annexes and all of that stuff. I make them, I'm a novelist, so I try to make them fun. Um, <laughs> rarely works. So my question to you, with, at the risk of putting myself out of a job, when you mentioned the, the changing of the deliverables, what does that mean to you, and would it come from our side or USAID side? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the, those 500,000-page reports that you work with, and I'm so glad that you try to novelize those. I would, I would love to read a chapter of one of those. Um, <laughs> they don't have to be that way. It's just that that is how it's been done. So part of the change process is to look at our operations and how we do things and um, 
the, you know, looking at that particular piece, that is happening really unevenly across the agency. So you're still writing your 500,000 page reports, but somebody else is doing a video report, right, that is designed to um, inform uh, their AOR or COR about what's happening, but also to be used in partner meetings or in meetings with the government or um, as a knowledge product to share within USA to inform other program designs and so on. Um, so that's an example. Uh, we've seen um, missions and Washington operating units including deliverables such as participating in a roundtable for peer learning, participating in a community of practice, sometimes running a community of practice, um, uh, working against a learning agenda and then coming up with their own way of, of capturing and sharing um, the learning that comes out of that. We've seen some really interesting graphic annual reports or graphic final reports. So there's a lot of room for experimentation, but that uh, has to go hand in hand with educating the USAID AORs and CORs and the other people who are involved in design, the, the contracts and agreements officers about just thinking beyond how it's always been done. Um, so again, that, it's something that we do. We try to elevate examples of that. It's pretty uneven. Um, there's a lot of confusion around what's required and what's just what is typically done. So it, that's an awareness campaign that I think we're going to be looking at for a while. But we are seeing more innovation there, and I think that that's really exciting. Um, I don't know if that addresses log frames and adaptivity. <laughs> I think we're just going to have to admit it. Yeah. Just, it's okay. It's a, We're going to embrace log yeah. frames. You here. need a support group of those of you who love log frames. Um, but, you know, I think the thing about the log frame, right, is there's nothing inherently bad about a log frame. It's a heuristic. The problem is when the log frame then becomes the thing. The thing. Right, exactly. Yeah, so you might want to speak to that as well. So we're, we're trying to re restore it to its original position as a heuristic or any other... Um, uh, logic model, any other graphic depiction of our, our theory of change. They're all incomplete, they're all imperfect. Um, we need to uh, use them to inform our work and reflect on it, not to lead us by the nose down a path that turns out not to be relevant any longer. I don't think I have anything else to add on the, the logic models or log frames. I, I guess what I would say is that we don't want them to become the thing, and we don't want to be entirely locked into them. And I think that if we're looking at the logic model, perspective, how there is that challenge of having to come up with these quarterly reports and other kinds of requirements that are part of our mm -hmm. agreements that we have. And one thing that I will say, and this is a shout out to the USAID management team for k for health is that I do feel like that it's a conversation with your USAID partner. And we're lucky that we're working with people. We're working on a knowledge management project. Our management team is very um, bought into trying to be flexible and adaptive. So over time, what I've seen on our particular project is that there has been quite a bit more flexibility to take that step back from the work plan and say, wait a minute, is this activity really working? No, it's not. Can we reprogram that funding to somewhere where it's going to be getting us a little bit more bang for our buck? So luckily, I think I've seen, I've seen that flexibility with the team that we're working with. Um, the other thing I was going to say related to that oh, quarterly reports, I think, again, you know, over time, maybe many people in the room are doing this kind of thing, but, you know, trying to make a quarterly report fun like a novel or, you know, bringing that interactive element in, I think is a little bit of a challenge because you are trying to write against, you know, the accomplishments and you need to get your achievements out there. You want them codified. You want them somewhere that, you know, people know how well you're doing in terms of your project and you're learning from that. But what we've been doing over time with that is, again, in partnership with our USAID management team is, they've been very helpful in saying, we want no more than X number of pages. So it forces us to be concise, which is great. And then on the flip side, what we've been trying to do is just make it more visual. So really, you know, we have a by the numbers piece that's more of a data visualization or infographics and those kinds of things. And then just related to that, um, thinking about ways in which we can really make, I think, make learning a little bit more fun for people. I think, um, 
when I was taking a, a colleague of mine teaches about data visualization, and one thing that she says is she talks about the average attention span of a goldfish versus a human. Um, mm -hmm. And so as it turns out, the goldfish has a longer attention span than we do. Um, so bearing that in mind, and also just coming off a big storytelling event where we were knowing that we have to catch people right away with the, the key messages. And so ways in which we're trying to do that on our project are doing short white bridge board videos. So we're taking complex topics, but we're trying to simplify them without diluting them so it's very digestible for our audiences. And of course, a number of other ways in which we can do that. Videos are amazing visuals. So just my two cents on that. Thanks. I just want to quickly add to that because um, our management team too is also is very supportive. Um, and then as actually our, our AOR is here. Kristen wears and they are very um, they push us really hard to put out things that are useful and you know shorter and visually appealing and uh, not you know that allow and to do it more quickly and we do have some flexibility in our work plans um, and adjust things if they're not working out I think where we get hung up um, is is we have to have we have to have accountability so there's still that need for approval there's still need to you know spend pipelines um, you know, there's so there's there's a little bit of a tension there that um, that it's, that still exists. Um, but I mean, I think that we're you know we're, we have a we're very supported. I think, and and also they really you know our management team holds us to really demonstrating how what we're doing is improving health, you know, or improving these outcomes, and so that we can justify a lot of things as long as we can make those connections. And I think that's important to be held to. Great, thanks. Thanks to all of you. This was a really wonderful discussion. Thanks to this wonderful audience. I, uh, I should admit, when I saw the rains this morning, I was like, oh my gosh, like, will we have people come in? And thank you, as I said, for braving that gloomy weather. So uh, just to recap, I'll take two minutes. You know, we were never going to address all the world's CLA challenges in one forum like this. But I think uh, the fact that we all got together and shared our experiences is already a lesson in learning and is already learning about learning, right? And I think that that's been a great experience in itself. Just a few highlights that clearly came out. You know, it's always nice to kind of perhaps uh, close um, a session like this with a few concrete recommendations. And I think we got a number of those from our esteemed panelists. I love the metaphor of uh, CLA like a ship. Um, and I think it's so true of CLA in general. It is a work in progress. It's a ship sailing and you know, there's rough seas and all this stuff. And I think it's, it's great. I think that poem should probably be uh, the kind of CLA poem. Um, um, also, also on how to build CLA. You know, if, we, if we weren't going to build a sail and plant it in the ocean, then I think one of the messages is let's, let's not build CLA that way. Let's build it in a very thoughtful, rigorous uh, um, manner. Uh, so for example, when we are putting together m and &E plans and program implementation plans and work plans, let's infuse that with learning. Let's build a learning agenda as well and let's, them all have, uh, let's, uh, let's have them all talk to each other. And I think that was key. You know, often we, in the past, we did not build learning agendas and we've started doing that too. Um, uh, I loved uh, the focus on uh, linking CLA to better development outcomes. Do not do it if it's mm -hmm. just paying lip service to the term or the acronym. Um, and I love the focus uh, that we heard that said, do not downplay the rigor of the measurement. Uh, um, and that's important as well in order to get to really good learning that can be adapted. Um, I love hearing fail and fail fast. Uh, it's something that we haven't heard in the development, international development space. Um, you know, my IT colleagues talk a lot about that, but we haven't heard it. And I think even hearing that is important. Um, you know, today when I look at uh, data and, and there's, a, there's, there's, there's a problem, two years back I'd probably be like, oh no, and today I'm like, oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening? I want to learn what's happening. And, I, and, you know, and we want to make those improvements. So, so I think that, that's the spirit. There's a lot here about the spirit of learning and adapting. Um, and it does make us look at our own work differently, and that's important. Yeah. And we focus less on failures, but we focus more on turning failure to success. 
and that's key. I also heard fail and fail fast, but win and win fast as well. And I think that's an important lesson. So there's no reason to downplay the little successes, even if it is a very small success, and build on it and take that to scale. Um, last but not least, I think it's the C and CLA. It's probably the one piece in CLA we can often diminish, um, but realistically, we can have the best m &E systems in place, and, and we can do the best research. Uh, and we might even be able to get to the best learning, but if we cannot have collaborating as the glue that ensures that our stakeholders, our, our in-country governments, own the, own the learning and adapting, um, and, and are truly part of that decision making around learning and adapting, then all that learning might come to naught. And it, and it might not get adapted. It might not go into programmatic um, adaptation or policy change. And I, so, and I think the C is kind of, you know, the, the often maybe neglected or ignored part, but I think, I think we heard from a lot of you that, that it's really being inclusive is, is really key for learning and adapting to be a success. Um, I think that was, that was amazing. Thanks to all of you, Pearls of Wisdom. Uh, and I, I hope we can all take this forward. Um, we will look out, I'm assuming, at the Learning Lab for further guidance and you know, case competitions and all the, all the great work that's coming out. So thank you. Uh, and thanks, thanks to all of you for coming. Just one last a quick announcement since I have you all in your seats is I just wanted to recognize the committee members that helped to put this on. So if you guys could stand up really quick, really quick. Um, thank you. Everybody. And she's, they're standing over here too. Thank you all so much. We encourage you to stick around. There's hopefully still coffee out there unless we've, <laughs> yeah, coffee, yeah. Thank you so much.